I decided to start doing videos again. You might know me from my adult work. You might know me from my writing. But uh, if you're watching this, you probably know a little bit about my personal life, which is, you know, that I, uh, you know, date trans women. Or I've, I've dated two of them. And I've gotten endless shit for this in my life. Uh, and, and a lot, one of the things I get accused of often is that uh, it goes back to me being in prison or that I did something in prison. I remember, um, you know, before I ever dated, <laughs> this is fucking an embarrassing one. Before I ever dated a trans woman, I had, uh, you know, I was dating my first real, real girlfriend. Um, someone I won't name here. I still got a lot of love for her. But uh, I just got out of jail. I was gone for like uh, four months. And I don't even know why, because like we were having sex, but like I, you know, I got on the porn, and she looked through my phone like three days after I had been home, and she found like the that kind of porn, and uh, she tripped out and was like, "Did you do this in jail?" And I was like, "What the fuck?" You know, I just, you know, that's the first time I got it, and I've been accused of it ever since. Um, and it's like a very different, like not, I don't know, but. Uh, it's definitely not how it started. And maybe I, I do plan on making a video about, like, all of the fucking horrible response, responses and repercussions I've had to face for uh, dating trans women. Uh, but for now, I'm going to talk about uh, gay people in prison. Um, now, there's a little bit of a different semantics here. They will call themselves sissies, and everybody else will say sissies. And much like a lot of slurs... Um, Depending on if you say it with venom, there's, you know, a little more hate to it. But uh, it doesn't necessarily mean, like, the sissy type thing that, like, you see in porn sometimes. Like, it's not really that. Um, it is kind of a little, but it's kind of just like the catch-all term. And under that umbrella, it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean female identifying. Um, it really kind of just means being effeminate. And that's kind of, like, within themselves. Um, <clears throat> but, like, for a regular type dude who isn't part of, like, you know, the community, like, any dude who's gay would be, like, oh, he's a fucking sissy. Like, that's, you know, is, would be how they would use it. Um, but you kind of just have to get over the semantics of it. Uh, it's not, like, a PC place, and uh, it's just going to be the word that they use. Um, you know, I don't know which of these people, you know, identified as female. Um you know, I'd kind of be curious to see what the culture is like now, now that uh, being trans is so much more accepted. And I wonder if it even, like, affected, you know, prison culture at all. One of the funniest things, I think, is, uh, you know, all this talk, like, that trans people are, like, afraid to go to uh, the men's prisons. Because all the, uh, you know, the sissies and, you know, the ones who I'm pretty sure identified as women, man, they seem to be, like, <laughs> they seem to be all right with being in men's prison. Like, they had, you know, dudes chasing them around, giving them food constantly. Like, uh, they're kind of living it up in there. Um, and they were, were, were far from being harassed or tormented. You know, they stuck together pretty well. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start off in the beginning. Um, before I ever went to prison, I had I, I clocked in about a year of county jail time. So I, I had heard all, everything you, you could learn about prison. You know, what you can order... Uh, in the magazines, you know, how long it takes to get your TV when you get there, everything. So people had told me, uh, there was this thing they'd say, don't mess with the three G's, gays, uh, gangs, and gambling. And um, personally, I would say the three D's, debt, drugs, and dick would be mine, because debt is really what it all comes down to, and dr with drugs comes the debt. Anyways, um... What they tell you, though, is, like, don't harass those sissies or those gay dudes because, first of all, a lot of them can fight. Um, if you can take something up your, your ass, I mean, you ain't, you ain't too weak. Um, and, and a lot of those those guys, they, they, they're, like, from Detroit and shit, and they walk around the yard, you know, sashaying. So it's like, you know, if you grew up walking like that in East Detroit, you know, you've probably been in a fight or two. So to assume they can't fight, and a lot of them are kind of, like, physically fit and shit, is just ignorant. Uh, but also, too, and, oh, okay, there are some real small ones. You don't know who they're fucking with on the yard. You know, there's people there, you know, doing things with on the undercover. And you might be teasing this little five foot two peaches, and then some big burly dude is stabbing you, and you don't know why. And it turns out that's Peaches' man. Um, 
you know, it's, it's just considered a very bad idea and there's nothing you gain from it because if you, uh, if you beat one of them up, like nobody's going to think you're cool. It's like beating up, uh, you know, the kid who's like a half a Momo in school, you know, like, you know, bullying can kind of like impress the crowd to a little bit, but not like that, you know? And, and I saw experience of it. I saw a firsthand experience of dudes getting beat up by gay guys. And it's like one of the worst things that can happen to you. Talk about, talk about being marked to target. Um, the one was, um, with a sissy named Savannah. And I think there's other dudes on YouTube that talk about Savannah. There's a few of them that are kind of like famous within the MDOC. So Savannah was like six foot three, which is like to try to fight Savannah. It was just kind of crazy. The physical difference alone. But, um, Savannah was like six foot three and she had like, dude, she made like a weave out of, um, shoelaces and she had modified her MDOC blues to be skin tight and shit. It was, it was kind of impressive, like the time commitment, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't really know Savannah like that, but this is one I would definitely assume identified as a woman. Well, uh, she was walking across the yard and like some short little black kid, you know, called her the F slur. And uh, Savannah, like, took off on him. And, I mean, I'm not making this up when I say that was probably one of the worst, like, ass beatings without a weapon I saw. Like, just beat downs. I mean, she, like, knocked the kid's teeth out. Um, we never saw either of them after that. Savannah got taken to the hole somewhere else. And then uh, that kid, when you when you get beat up that bad, a lot of times they'll ride you out somewhere because they know it's just, like, not good. And uh, getting beat up like a sissy like that, man, people don't forget. And I got a story about that. People don't forget. I swear to God. Y that kid could have found the cure for cancer from within prison 10, 15 years down the line. And people would still be like in the cut like, yeah, but remember when he got beat up by a sissy? People don't forget that shit. Um, there was this kid in my unit. He was right across the other side of the wall from me. And he was in the cube with this white sissy, which that makes it so much worse when it's the white sissy that, that beats you up, named Callie. Now, this dude definitely didn't identify as a woman. He had short hair, uh, kind of, I guess you would say, like an aged twink. <laughs> but dude was, like, in, in insane shape. I remember he was, like, curling the 50s, like, stuff I can't do. Him. You know, you say, I'm a pretty big dude. And, uh, you know, you just wouldn't want to fight him. He's tall, long arms. and the, But this kid that uh, he ended up getting a fight with was uh, – this short black kid who is like a, a compulsive liar. We called him the MMA fighter because he, or as he called it, yeah, I used to fight in the UFC. Like he didn't know that UFC, he thought UFC was the name of the sport. He was like one of those guys. But he would, uh, you know, I remember he claimed like, my fighting weight is 220. And then he claimed, like, I would hear him say, oh, I was fighting at 220, then I got up to 230, then 240, then 250, then dropped down to 180. He's claiming he fought, like, at a 100-pound range. And, you know, I don't think he ever was different than his, the 170 he weighed. So all that talk of being the UFC fighter, um, once again, he called Callie uh, the F-slur. That was what set it off. And they had been living in the cube together, so this had been, like, you know, going on for a while. And uh, Callie just took off on him. And I mean, like kind of molly whopped him i know that kid didn't get out of the bunk for a couple of days like he ate his commissary and you know he didn't want people to see how bad he didn't want the co's to see how bad his ass was beat because if the co's see uh see you walking around if and you're all butchered up they're just going to come and pull you off the yard one thing i often get asked about is if guards were gay and i have i just have like two little instances when i had first got there there was the CO that was, uh, he worked in the kitchen and he was just coming off a of suspension. He got suspended for like 30 days or something because he got caught with an inmate in the freezer or something. He didn't get caught in the act. Like, you know, the dude must have got his pants zipped up, but they pretty much knew what was going on. But, uh, you know, those guys have a pretty good union. They couldn't fire him. But, uh, yeah, he had to come back and it was kind of like a known thing that that's pretty much what he. <laughs> all but got caught doing and uh you know i'm pretty sure that's that went on more times than that because i remember there was kind of the gang leader of the sissies because the sissies they're almost like their own little gang they stick together like one but uh the leader was this this one called diamond and uh man diamond used to smoke cigarettes on the yard like it wasn't against the the rules and he had a lighter which isn't that crazy i mean it's pretty crazy but it's not unheard of but when he got shaken down finally one time and they found like cash money on him 
So people were hypothesizing that he was like fucking with one of the COs in his unit to get cash money and, and all the other stuff. Who knows? Uh, there was one other guy, this, this real fat CO with uh, the MSU Spartan he had tattooed on his neck. People would say that if you were like a young boy, he would let you out of trouble, but I never really uh, had an interaction with him. Uh, other than that, though, there, it's, it's hard to tell exactly how many gay people there really are in prison because you have what I said is the sissies. But to, to, to be a sissy, that's, that's like putting uh, your entire prison identity in that being gay. Um, and that definitely doesn't fit a lot of, uh, gay dudes. I think there's a lot of like, not even like totally masculine gay dudes, like just middle, even middle of the road gay dudes who probably wouldn't exactly feel comfortable doing that. Um, and if they were comfortable being out in prison, they might not exactly want to, uh, join the, uh, gay group because they're, they're a pretty tight knit group with their own culture. So you kind of have to you know, you kind of acquiesce to them more so than the other way around. So what I'm saying, so what I'm saying is, you know, you can't just count that small group as the only gay people in prison because, and I, obviously everybody knows about, uh, the guys on the down low. There's the joke that, you know, there's these guys you see on the yard that are walking around with a young boy and then you see them in the visiting room and they got like a beautiful wife visiting them. And uh, I never specifically saw anything like that. I mean, I'm sure that does happen. But uh, there's definitely it are, like, the guys who fuck with them, the sissies on the down low. And there's times when it comes out and, uh, you know, it can be a big scandal, especially if the dude is, like, you know, a bit of a player. But what's interesting is uh, if, you're, if you're enough of a player, or, or more so if you're tough enough, um, people can't really say shit to you. Like there's the, and, and if you're really a badass, you can kind of just do it openly. Um, I remember there was this one dude who was, uh, he, he must've been like a higher ranking, uh, one of the Muslim guys. I can't remember what exactly group he was in, but I went to go, uh, buy some contraband off him. I, I won't say what, cause it's YouTube, but I went to buy some con uh, expensive contraband off him and I'm talking out, he's, he's sitting down by the softball field on a bench and uh, I'm talking to him trying to negotiate this deal. And it's like, you know, $500 in Western union numbers. And, uh, the whole time he's, he's getting his foot massaged by, by his, his boy, it's a little young black kid. And I like, it was just fucking me up, you know? And I was like, I asked him, I was like, Hey man, can you stop that? Man, this dude snapped at me. Motherfucker, don't be talking to him. And uh, he, he, like, wouldn't deal with me after that. I had to, like, send an intermediary to talk to him. But, yeah, that dude, so that dude was in an organization where it's, like, it's not okay to be gay. But he was openly doing it. So, you, you know, it really shows in there. Um, there's a lot of homophobia, but at the same time, people are, like, pretty willing to turn the other way. Uh, you, you also, like, you, you're around it 24-7 to an extent. Like, that... Even if you are homophobic, eventually you just it stops, I guess, triggering you so bad. You know, I guess it's like, uh, what is it? The immersion therapy for for gay stuff. You know, I remember um, I, I was in my unit, and there there's had been this dude dude in my unit that I knew from the world. Not very well. He was kind of a scumbag, but I knew him a little bit in the world. Being comes in my unit, it's kind of like wow, big deal because it's you know big state out there to run into somebody like that. So. I'm laying back in my bunk reading one night, like pretty late at night too. And I hear, and I look over on the side of my bunk and it's this dude. And he don't even lock in my cube, not even in my hallway or nothing. And I'm like, what the, you know, I so I'm pretty alerted. And he's like, John boy, John boy, let me get your knife. Cause I was the porter. So I had access to the porter closet and we had a knife up there. And, uh, I'm, I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong? He goes, I just went in the bathroom and there's two guys in there fucking. <laughs> and I just like, you know, I just looked at them and started laughing. You know, it was like one o'clock in the morning. I always said, man, look at how late it is. You can't be mad at them for that. And in fact, man, if you go try to make a big deal about this, they're going to be looking at you and wondering, you know, why you're making such a big deal about this or what you were doing frolicking around the, the prison bathrooms at 1 a.m. at night, you know, because what, what were you expecting? Of course, that's what's going on down there. Uh, 
you know, really people would look at it like they were being kind of respectful for waiting until that late. Uh, so, so you, and once again, like I said, he, he wouldn't have gained any points for doing anything about that. So it is really a, a kind of a different, it, it can be almost progressive in ways and with like this veneer of like complete homophobia, like how, you know, there is like quite a disdain for them by a large percentage of the regular population. But there is, you also are like, they are kind of coexist kind of better than we do out here sometimes, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's interesting. Um, I figured I'd talk, I'd, I'd touch on that topic. Uh, but yeah, it, um, I, I don't really see that relating to uh, me dating trans women. So there, there are like a, a substantial, I guess, amount of trans women in MDOC, I bet especially now, but they're kind of all kept at one place. So there's one specific prison called Parnell that was actually across the street from where I was. And there's one housing unit there. And I guess that's like if they're on like estrogen and shit, that's where they go. And the, I'm sure there's some scattered in other units, you know, but uh, I think they mainly try to keep them there because they cause so much drama. Um, you know, I had the attraction with porn, but I had never actually met one. And, um, you know, and I'll talk about this on other videos. It, it, when I actually met a trans woman, it was just, there was no, it was just like a regular woman. There was a bit of a novelty in it, I guess, sexually, but it was kind of nothing. Yeah. Um, no, so it, it didn't tie into it. Um, I met and got cool with like the first gay dude. There was like the first gay dude I really knew and was friends with in there. And I think I'd like to make a video about him. He was like, he was the type of gay dude that I think a lot of like Twitter lives fucking complain about, <laughs> you know? Just like very like, you know, I'm good looking. I want my partners to be good looking. I don't care. But uh, he was a, he was a funny dude, man. He was all right. That was gay Mike. And let me tell you, to get a prison's a pretty gay place. So to be, to get the nickname Gay Mike, you got to be pretty gay. This motherfucker used to sashay across the yard like it was, you know, the Milan Fashion Fest. You know, <laughs> fucking ridiculous. But uh, I pre if you've watched this long, I appreciate you watching. I'm going to try to edit this, make it a little bit better. Um, thank you. Please check out the website. Check out the book.